Okay, so before I actually start Dark Souls 2, this is the I kind of want to outline how I played Dark Souls 1 and why this is so... I don't know, like why it was so interesting for me and I played it so differently probably than other people. So I started off, I think I played... Yeah, I played the mage first because I like playing mages in games. So this was my first character. But what ended up happening, let me make sure I don't do the delete prompt first. Uh, you have to go H. Okay. So this was the mage character. So I started off completely blind, not playing online. You don't even get those little check mark boxes on the ground, like the three uh, arrows that give you advice. So I realized it's going to be too easy if I use everything at my disposal, even again on a first playthrough. Maybe the mage is just overpowered like that, but again, how would you know going in? So then when the split happened, right about Ornstein and Smog, right? You beat ONS and it opens the four, um, well, first of all, I started off only putting points in my core stat, right? So I only put points in intelligence. And then when I realized attunement was a thing, I didn't even know what it was for like half the game. Then I would put like half the points in that. So you could see like 63 to 31. So it should be exactly half. So you put in two points in intelligence and only one point in attunement for every two points and nothing else. You're not allowed to put in anything else. I think I might have put a little bit in decks just to be able to use certain weapons. I think up to 15 is kind of my rule. Anything beyond 15, you're not allowed. And again, that's only in case there's a certain weapon you want to use that you absolutely have to for your playstyle, like the S-Stock. I think I kind of needed for a magic weapon. But yeah, for the most part, no other stats besides your core stats. So it's almost like a character class in a game. Like you start, you choose your class. That's not really how these games work. But then you're locked into that class. You have certain strengths, certain weaknesses, some things you can do some th things you can't in this you can kind of just do whatever you want so the class is meaningless but yeah once i got to ornstein and smog i realized that the game had that split right you go to seath you go to nito you go to bed of chaos you go to four kings so once i saw that i stopped playing on there and then i made all these different characters with the same theme so this is like a strength character that uses a shield so you have strength and you have i think i broke the 15 rule here 16 decks Oh, and endurance. So this was a bit of a messy one. But the idea here was vita uh, vitality and strength, sort of like a tank-ish class. So you go half vitality, double strength. And the only reason why I'm doing strength isn't to be... Wait, no, is this the wrong one? No, this is the right one. Only reason you're doing strength is because you need it to use shields. So this is the only one who gets to use a shield, kind of like a tank class. And the only one I got any vitality on, I think, out of everybody, right? So that's vitality, strength. I kind of messed up with endurance and dexterity, but that's fine. Then this was a strength-only character. I don't think I even beat the game on all these, but I at least set up the format like I'm going to do a different lord or a different middle game boss with each of these. So they all get their own first impression of everybody. So for example, I beat Nito on, on the sorcerer because it feels like Nito is a sorcerer, necromancer. It seemed to fit. Then my first time fighting Seath was on this guy. So they each had their turn at a first attempt. And I did them all in like different orders. So my first kill of Seath was here. First kill of Nito was here. And then this was... Oh yeah, and also the DLC and the Painted World. I will admit I wasn't able to find that myself. But I knew that... Obviously I had the DLC. So I, I looked, I looked, I looked. I finally gave up. And so I did have to look up how to get into the DLC. And also how to get into the Painted World. So I did the DLC on this guy the first time. And this was still at the middle game part right at the split so i hadn't beaten anybody i went straight did the dlc on him uh this is a strength only character again breaking the dexterity rule a little bit just to use weapons breaking the endurance rule a little bit should be 15 cap but i think you need 18 to use and this was very fortuitous because obviously i didn't know that the black knight weapons had a chance to not drop because this was one of my first characters but i got very lucky and on the strength character, I got both the Black Knight Sword and the Black Knight Great Sword early. So it really fit and maybe made it too easy, but it fit with the playstyle at the least. So yeah, he took out Artorius and Manus. So again, two handed weapon only, strength, no shield, no vitality, nothing. This is the Pyromancer, so this was the most fitting one I thought would be the Bed of Chaos or the Fire Area. I, at first I thought it would be the Witch of Isolith, but they kind of fake you out, right? You think you're going to fight the Witch and then it's just this random, uh, like sort of the mother of Pyromancy thing. The first demon, I think they call it, like ever. So f this was Strength and Intelligence was supposed to be what it is. For some reason I have 17 Vitality. 
So I didn't do these perfectly, but the idea was there. So two points in strength for every one point in intelligence. And it almost should have been the opposite, but I guess you don't find very many pyromancies early game, so I kind of probably reversed it. I started with intelligence and then I stopped. Yeah, you can even tell because it's over half. So I must have started getting half strength to uh, intelligence and then I realized I'm not going to be able to use it for a while because I couldn't find any pyromancies for a super long time. Even now I only have two slots so I don't think uh, attunement was allowed here. I have the calamity ring on. So yeah this faced off against bed of chaos it seems fitting like you're facing off against the fire area as a pyromancer even if that makes it harder. This was the four kings and I even have like all the dark or not really dark, but I have the dark hands and stuff. Or wait, no, this was the painted world. This is like a rogue. You can only use daggers and shields just to parry. No ranged weapon. So see, I even went as far as to separate range dexterity from melee dexterity. So I made two characters who are dex only, but this is the rogue, like close combat thief, where you can only use daggers and shields. And the hunter is only range. You can only use bows. So you can't mix the two styles. Um, so this is dex only. This looks pretty clean. Zero points in anything else. So you suffer from all the weaknesses that come along with that. But you get the strength. So same thing in Dark Souls 2. It'll be like I might get some overpowered weapon that I can use super early that nobody else would use. Because I commit so hard. Like that happened with Soul Spear. I didn't know what Soul Spear was or anything. But I was anticipating when am I going to get a really cool spell. And as soon as I got it I could immediately use it. Because I had committed so hard to intelligence. That was like 36 you need. And you get it from Big Hat Logan in Sen's Fortress when you rescue him. So most people probably wouldn't have been able to use it then. But that was my reward I guess for such a hard commit. So yeah he took out the painted world. The rogue. It's almost like he went to go and steal a painting. And then he got trapped inside. Sort of an RP aspect to explain you know why that one. And then... The hunter took out the four kings. No real good RP explanation there, just happened to fit the only thing I hadn't done yet. 51 decks, 20 strength. So that again must be because you need it for like the Dragon Slayer Great Bow or whatever it is. Because otherwise I would never get strength. Even 14 endurance, I'm not really sure why, unless you start with that. But yeah, dexterity only, weapon considerations are allowed. I think I was using the Ring of Favor and Protection on everybody. Oh, and there's even certain items and things I could only use on some, right? Like Gravelord stuff. This was more like a second playthrough consideration. So I can commit to the Gravelord on here and nobody else. I can learn all the spells, like the secret spells from Big Hat Logan um, here. I could do what on this guy? It's like a, something to look forward to on a second playthrough. I'm not really sure what I would do on him. Here I could learn more pyromancies, something rare, I forget. Maybe talk to the witch in Blight Town. Again, all these things I couldn't figure out. As thorough as I try to be, I didn't 100% uh, it like I tried to. So I eventually, after like 300 hours, I gave up trying 100%. And then I could, you know, dive into all the extra hidden stuff. Like Ash Lake. Who really finds Ash Lake on their own? It's like a double fake out. You have to break the wall, invisible wall, and then break another one. So anyone who says they got that without looking it up is probably lying. Or they're super thorough. And this guy gets the dragon. No, that's the hunter. He gets the dragon head to mix up the gameplay a little bit. I don't know what this guy gets. He, I guess he gets the dark hand just because it looks cool and kind of fits. So I think those are the six, right? Four, five, six. So th again, you beat Seath, Nido, Artorius Manus, Bed of Chaos, The Painted World, and Priscilla, the four kings. So they each took out those as the first one, and then you can decide from there. I forget which order exactly I did them all in, but it gave a different first experience for each of those encounters to really mix it up and really commit. These I didn't really do too much. This is like a hard tank, right? 30 vitality, so vitality and endurance, nothing else. Yeah, it's trying to make committed character classes in Dark Souls. I'm not sure exactly what this was. Oh, this is like a dark, dark mage. So you use all the dark spells only. And apparently dexterity is, is a big thing. So I must have been going for like a pyromancer, dexterity, dark mage, hybrid, all in one. And he even has that thing on his head. What is it? That secret. I forget the name of it. You get it like in the pathway to Demon Fire Sage in like the shortcut. 
So yeah, that's a cool thematic character. I don't think I got very far with him. And this would be like the cleric. I never did a he healer type. So I think the whole reason I chose a dex character for part two was because I was disappointed you couldn't dual wield in this one, only to find out that you can't really dual wield effectively in that one either, I guess, at least as far as I know. So I ended up using two hand decks in uh, Dark Souls 2. And I also use like a one-handed Cestus. So I'm allowed to use either one-hand decks or two-hand decks. But I'm not allowed to use an offhand, like a shield or some other kind of like a staff or anything, obviously. And so it's a dex only. Little strength consideration, maybe up to 15 just for weapons if I need it. So yeah, that gives an idea of how I played Dark Souls 1 and why it was so amazing and memorable. Again, how many people probably did that? Where they played through the game four times at once before beating it. I didn't beat it on everybody at the same time, but I ultimately beat it on my mage first, still. Level 72. Where does it actually show that? Like, does it show that you've beaten the game or not? I guess I could check. So yeah, that's the character outline. So for my Dark Souls 2, dexterity only, two-handed, no bows allowed, none of that. I rarely use items. And what else? It's going to be like no advice, no online, no hints on the ground, right? To the extent you can prevent those, which I think is pretty much completely if you play offline. I will be able to pause it. I use that universal pause button. I'll be able to pause and people will say, oh, that makes it too easy. That's like cheating. Even though like Sekiro, ha people always used to say that about Dark Souls. Like, oh, it's so hard because you can't pause it. And then Sekiro comes out and people say, oh, it's so hard, even though you are able to pause it. So apparently it didn't matter much. If you tried to say that then, they'd say, oh, you're just a casual. Stop complaining. Get good. All that kind of stuff. What else was I going to say? I'm very thorough with exploring. I don't use items a lot. I won't say I don't use any items like ever. Like gold, pine, resin and stuff. I tend to avoid it. It's not even like, oh, I'm trying to make it harder for myself just to show like, oh, I'm so good. It just makes it more fun. You commit to a play style. Lost Sinner took me like seven hours to beat. That was the last boss I beat because it was like, and this was like two years ago too, that I last played it. It was kind of, I left it in the middle of the playthrough, which I don't like doing, but it happens. And yeah, it took me like seven hours because of that broken hitbox on the one straight slash where it hits you even if you roll away every time. So no ADP, no other stats. I didn't know how important ADP was or it makes the hitboxes work actually properly, like how they should work. But yeah, I'm not getting any of that, even though it would kind of fit with the dex build. Um, I'm not doing it. I didn't go in planning to use it. And I guess I kind of got spoiled on that. The idea that it tells you what they do kind of in the menu if you look at them, but it doesn't tell you to that extent. Like it makes hitboxes actually work properly. Otherwise they suck. Imagine having to, it's such a horrible stat idea to have to put points into a stat just to make the game work the way it should work anyway. Not saying the hitboxes in this game are perfect, but imagine hindering something basic like that just to put it, commit to a stat to fix it. So that was a dumb idea. I hope that's not in Dark Souls 3. Uh, it's not in Demon Souls either, so... The human effigy thing is interesting, because whenever I started to get low on effigies and health, like my max health, I started to play a lot better. Whereas in this game, when you kept dying, it's like there's no consequence for dying. So it's a subconscious thing where you don't really feel as motivated to play better because there's nothing at stake. There's nothing on the line. So I know a lot of people probably don't like that mechanic from Dark Souls 2 or Demon Souls. It cuts it in half. I guess that's too absolute where most people probably just stack vitality to offset it. But in Dark Souls 2, I do kind of like that. I saw a real increase in performance. The lower on max health I would get, the lower on effigy. I'm like, this is my last effigy. I have to beat the boss. Otherwise, it's going to be impossible now. I mean, I have no health, no way to get it back. And effigies are very scarce, I will say. So yeah, I think that's everything from Dark Souls 1. I just wanted to go through that. So yeah, I didn't necessarily beat the game on everybody, but it's still an ongoing thing I could do. And like I said, there's a lot of stuff to look forward to on the multiple playthroughs because it would be like all the Gravelord stuff I could get. I don't even have a talisman on this guy, and I don't think I can get one because I killed all the shops. So now I have to beat the game to unlock the talisman to be able to use the Gravelord item. So I do play on mouse and keyboard. I am able to pause it. People probably will complain about that a lot, the uh, mouse and keyboard thing. Why don't you just use a controller? But it should be fine. I'm used to it. I used the controller a little bit in this, but it didn't really seem to matter much to me.